Um, so, as Jeremy said, our next talk, uh, Manuel Iberl, talking about <coughs> automating asymptotics in a theorem driven version. Thank you very much, Manuel. Is the microphone working? That doesn't sound like it's not. Okay, I didn't switch it on. I know I didn't, sorry. Is it working now? Oh, very good. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Manuel. Uh, I'm a PhD student. Um, I've been working with Isabel for many years, and I've uh, been in the last year of my PhD for the last three years now. Um, uh, and I want to talk today about some of the, the main work that I did uh, during my PhD. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about my Christmas project. And my Christmas project was I just uh, took some lecture notes about transcendental number theory, so showing that zeta of 3 is irrational. Um, and uh, so it's, it's like a five page PDF, and it's written like in a very accessible style, so any undergraduate student of mathematics should be easily able to read that. Um, I'm not expecting you to read this now. Um, and that sounds hard to read because you didn't know DR. There's a D lower R Sorry? that was not defined in the PDF. Uh, the case. Um, and this is obviously not just in this case, but this is what pretty much always happens, and this is uh, called the, the Brown factor, or as I call it, the curse of the Brown. Um, so whenever you do mathematics in a proof assistant, uh, it turns out that it's, when you, the proofs uh, in, in the system are much longer than they are on paper, and they take much longer to write, and you have lots of tedious steps. Um, where you have to prove something that's completely obvious and it takes you much longer than you would expect or hope it to be. Um, so that's it, the case. Well, there's many reasons for this and I'm probably not, uh, I'm not trying to give an exhaustive list there. This is just what I uh, came up with off the top of my head. Um, I want to talk about one in particular, which is what I call um, externalization of work in paper proof. So when you have a, a paper proof, you can uh, basically take some of the work that is that you would have to do to do this proof and externalize it somehow, typically to a reader. And one way you can do this is um, you can use some ambiguities, like uh, you don't really precisely define something, but you just leave it a little bit, little bit amb amb ambiguous, and the reader has to think a bit, and then uh, the reader at some point realizes, ah, this is probably what the author meant. Um, uh, and you can hand wave certain things a little bit, and then the reader has to figure out if they're interested in this, why does it actually hold. Um, in the proof system, you can't get away with this. You always have to define very precisely what is it that I'm talking about. And uh, also, there are other side conditions, like you, you, divide, you have to prove that you don't divide by zero, you have to, if you interchange the order of uh, integration, you have to prove that the function is actually integrable. Uh, or if you pull a derivative into an integral, you have to prove uniform convergence and all of these things. And on paper, people pretty much don't do this, but in the theorem proof that every time you do something like this, you have to actually prove every single side condition. Um, and also, uh, if you do mathematics on paper, you have this huge uh, repository of, of library results. Like there's lots of mathematical papers, and you can, if, if one of them has a result that you like, you can just cite them, use the result, and that's it. There's an Ethereum proof there. Well, in principle, of course, you can use anything that another person has formalized at some point, but most mathematics has never been formalized. And even if it has been formalized, well, maybe it was formalized in, in Koch, but you're using Isabel, or, or maybe it was formalized in Moon 3 and using Moon 4. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's always another problem that we face that traditional mathematicians don't really know in that form. 
Um, so how do we solve this? And I have no idea. Uh, but there's like a partial solution to like a part of the problem that I want to talk about today. And that's, um, well, first of all, good and concise notation helps because it, it, it shrinks the size a little bit more and, and, and uh, helps you to express what you actually mean. And good automation, that's the main point. Uh, and because when you have the follow proof, you can also externalize work to the reader. Uh, the reader just is the proof assistant. So uh, you just need to teach the proof assistant some skills first. Um, so <coughs> domain specific automation is where I want to talk. Um, and I claim that human mathematicians have um, large, a large repertoire of domain specific automa uh, automation that they, they built into their brains. Because in high school, at some point, they learned how do I solve a quadratic equation. Only in characteristic, not two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then whenever you have a quadratic equation in the paper, you don't have to like explicitly list the steps how to get there. You can just like completely skip that and just trust that the reader knows what you're doing. Uh, they know how to take a derivative, uh, and they know how to expand some uh, fraction to partial fractions and these kinds of things. So you don't have to mention these anymore. You don't even have to cite anything for that. It, it just happens automatically. But I just you do it, and then we trust that the reader also does it in their brain. And this just saves a lot of time. So um, what I said before that mathematicians like to be ambiguous and hand wave and papers. Um, we shouldn't get the impression that I'm, I think that's a bad thing. I think that's a very necessary thing because if you uh, it, it it still works. Like the reader still can usually figure out what's going on, and it saves a lot of time and space. Um, and uh, so my, I claim that for effective formalization of mathematics. We also need to teach skills like these uh, to, to proof assistants. And uh, examples are already there, so I'm just, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of examples in, in other systems as well, but I, I just, uh, I, I came up with this off the top of my head right now, and so these are things from Isabel that I could just remember. Um, so one of them is just, we have equations, and equations even you want to cancel common factors. Um, and this happens automatically in Isabel when you just call it simplify, you don't have to, to call anything by, by, uh, by hand. Um, or linear arithmetic, so this is also something that happens automatically when you have something that can just be proven by linear arithmetic, it just happens in the background, you don't have to do anything. Um, and another one uh, is uh, approximation using interval arithmetic, so when you have something like, I don't know, e minus pi and you want to prove that that's negative, then you can just press a button and it does it for you behind the, behind the scenes. Um, or another one uh, is, you have square root of 16 and that's obviously 4, but it's not actually easy to achieve this kind of thing uh, automatically in a theory improver with, um, unless you write a specific procedure to do this for you. And so that's what I do with Isabel. It only takes like, I don't know, 20 lines of code, and then you, you have that. And it, it, it doesn't really, it's not a big thing, but it, uh, it's just one less thing you have to worry about when you formalize mathematics. So it, it's a little thing that can help occasionally. Um, or you can prove that the number is a prime number using PrEP certificates, which is a lot easier and then faster than doing the, the entire computation, which can uh, take much longer for big numbers. Um, or uh, when Lee has this nice uh, automation for relating winding numbers, because this is actually, if you have a co contour integral of uh, complex numbers, it's, uh, and you want to show that it, this actually winds around only once, so uh, it's clockwise, and it's, it's very difficult, and this procedure helps in many cases. But what I want to talk today about is real asymptotics. So, yeah, now I'm going to focus on Isabel, and I'm going to focus on real asymptotics. So what is Isabel? Um, I'm sure most of you probably have a fairly good idea. Um, so it's, it's an interactive theory improver. We mostly use higher order logic. You can use other logic, but um, not many people do that these days. Um, there are no dependent types, but for the thing that I present, that doesn't really matter very much. And uh, importantly, there's a very large library of real and complex analysis. Um, and there's this thing called the Archive of Formal Proofs, which is a large collection of Isabel proof developments that are constantly kept working. So uh, whenever we change something in Isabel, we also have to change it in the Archive of Formal Proofs so that these developments never break. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, asymptotics in the proof system, or uh, I should say in Isabel, um, what, what is the problem with that? So, Imagine you have the following limit, uh, x squared minus x goes to infinity, for x going to infinity. Fairly obvious, you would think, and any real mathematician would probably 
just say this is trivial, like why, why are you bothering me with this? But if you want to prove this on a proof system, it's it's not quite as easy. Uh, so you have to you have to figure out how to do it. So the, uh, the tip, what you would probably come up with is, oh, okay, I can factor this into x times x minus one, and then I have uh, a product of two things that both that both go to infinity, and so the entire thing goes to infinity. Um, but but if you want to prove this by hand, you just have to like first do the factorization, which is obviously it's simple, but it's one step. And then you have to uh, to, to remember the the theorem names and have to plug them together in the right way. And so if you do this once, it doesn't really matter. But if you have to, if you're doing a larger proof development, you have to do something like this every five minutes. It gets really annoying. So you want, you don't want to think about something like this. If you don't, if you don't have to think about it in paper, you don't want to think about it in the theorem prover either. And so another um, less trivial example is uh, also something that I found most recently, which is the uh, Stitches constants. Um, and they appear in the uh, Laurent series expansion of the zeta function around one. And they're defined like this. And then the first question when you write this down in, in Isabel is, well, so why, does this, why is this even well defined? So why does this sum even exist? Does anyone have a suggestion? log to the power n, obviously. Say? Log k to the power n. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the iterated logarithm, it's log k to the power of n. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Um, the reason is that this summand is actually uh, asymptotically equivalent to log k to the n divided by k squared which is the error of k to the minus three halves, and uh, the sum over k to the, to the x, the sum over if x is less than, one, uh, than minus one. And in this case, it is because it's three halves. So, um, yeah, the problem is you have to first show that this, this big sum is actually big error of k to the minus three halves. And if you want to do this by hand, it's going to take you a while. And one last example, and this was this example is actually the reason why I started doing this entire project. So there is something called the Akrabatsi theorem, which is a generalization of the famous master theorem for dividing concave recurrences. So if you have some kind of recurrence that is defined in a dividing concave pattern way, and you want to know what the asymptotic growth of that is, then this theorem tells you what it is. And uh, for, for proving this Akrabatsi theorem, there was this one limit that I had to show. So there, there are some conditions on these variables, I'm just not showing them. And you have to show that this big term goes to zero uh, from above. And the problem is that you have cancellation there in this. So yeah, you subtract two terms, but uh, the, uh, the uh, fastest growing terms in the asymptotic expansion are actually equal, so they, they cancel. And so doing this, um, yeah, so the, the original author said, uh, yeah, this is like a trivial, like he didn't even bother to prove this. He said in a footnote, you just Taylor expand it, that's it. And, that, and he was right, but back then I had no idea what he was talking about. And um, yeah, so this is what the statement looks like in Isabel. And uh, so with, with you just write down the limited filters, I'm not going to talk about that. And uh, what I didn't show, did not show on the slide, is it took me like 700 lines to actually prove this. And I think it took me about a week. Um, and this is very, very painful. Um, but now we have automation, we just do this and it, it proves it automatically in half a second. So now the question is, how does that work? So the trick is to use multi-series expansions. And this is pretty much more or less the same thing that uh, computer algebra systems like Mathematica or Maple also use. Um, and so I should mention that none of this award was called invented by me. I was just the guy who uh, implemented this in Isabel. And uh, there are like so two related publications on this uh, that explain how this works. And then there's uh, my paper at ISAC from this year, which uh, explains a little bit about how this works in Isabel. <coughs> and so what is a multi-series expansion? So um, it's a little bit like a power series expansion. <laughs> But the problem is that power series expansions don't really work in a lot of cases. So if you have something like uh, each of the x for x going to infinity, then that doesn't have a power series expansion. And the same is true for, for the logarithm and then for the gamma function. Um, so you, you need something that's a bit more um, powerful than power series expansion. So um, one example would be, okay, we have the function uh, x plus log x to the minus one. 
for uh, x going to, uh, what is this probably going to infinity? Um, and then you, you can uh, uh, asymptotically expand this in this way. But as you can see here, um, you have not only powers of x, but you also have powers of log x. So it's kind of a powerful extension in several variables, and the variables are different functions of x. Um, and um, the, the trick is that these basis, yeah, so formally it's, it, yeah, it's exactly that. Um, um, like it's, it's a kind of a formal power series in, in, in several basis functions. And the trick is that you build this basis, like this list of basis functions, in such a way that you have them ordered by growth. So the, the logarithm of any uh, earlier one grows fa uh, faster than the logarithm of any later one, which also means that every, any positive power of uh, an earlier function will completely eclipse any power of a later function. So this is the case for, for, uh, for the exponential function in x, and it's the case for x and the logarithm of x, and for log x and log log x, etc. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, so these, these are kind of the, these expansions are the things that we want to find. We have some uh, real value function as an input, and this is, we want to find an expansion like this as an output. So, uh, yeah, typical basis look like this. Um, so, you typically have uh, x somewhere in the middle, and then you have like iterated logarithms of x somewhere in the back, and then in the front you have exponentials of some stuff. Okay, so um, one way to look at this in a, a like more computer science inspired way, I, I would say, like, well, uh, maybe this is the wrong way to say, it, but like a quite a great way to, to look at it is the first, uh, okay, basis is just a list of uh, real value functions. And then you define a type of multi series. Uh, so I should mention this is not how it looks in Isabel. This is just like a kind of high level way um, to look at it that, that hopefully is a bit more uh, illuminating. Um, so you define a, a multi-series is, uh, is a type that uh, um, depends on a, on a basis. And uh, if, you have, if your basis is the empty basis, then a multi-series with that basis is just a single real constant. And otherwise, it's a lazy list of, a, of pairs of multi-series with uh, the, uh, the smaller basis, so where you, where you forget about the first basis element, and the real number. So the, the first thing is the... Um, this is working. So this, oops, uh, this bit here is basically the coefficient, and this thing is the exponent. And then you have a, an, a possibly infinite list of these things, and that's your multi-series uh, for the bigger basis. So you can think about it as a kind of, uh, it's, it's like a power series expansion, where each coefficient is again a power series expansion, uh, but with a smaller basis. And you do that all the way until you have the empty basis, and then you have just a single number. So it's kind of like a, like an infinitely branching tree. Um, yeah. And of course, this is, doesn't capture everything. So you have uh, these additional uh, assumptions that the, the bases have to be sorted by growth and the exponents have to be decreasing, etc. But this is sort of the, the basic data structure that we're, we're working on. And uh, so now you can define operations on these multi-series. So you can, for instance, define a negation function that takes a multi-series and gives you a multi-series with the same basis, but for the negated function. And uh, you can just define that uh, recursively. So uh, you, yeah, if you negate a constant, you just negate the constant. And if you have a series, then you just map over the series and negate all, recursively negate all the coefficients. And, and yeah, that's it. So um, now you can, I'm, I'm not going to show how this works in detail, but you can, in, in a similar fashion, you can define um, basic multi series for all basic operations that you that you have that you can define what is the expansion of a constant what is the expansion of the identity function what is uh, the expansion of when I add two expansions and how do I multiply two expansions and uh, all of these can be defined uh, in, a, in a fairly simple co recursive way and uh, you can also define if I have a convergent power series so like a Taylor series expansion for instance how do I substitute a multi series into that Taylor series expansion? And um, that tells you how, to, um, how to, to take the logarithm of a power series expansion or the exponential or the sine, et cetera, uh, at non singular points. So if you, have, if you want to know what is e to the f of x, where you already have an expansion for f of x, then uh, you can just substitute it into the Taylor series extension of, of uh, 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 the exponential function. 
if uh, the f does not go to infinity. And for the logarithms, it's, it's the same as long as it doesn't go to zero infinity. So as long as you have a substitution into a function which does not have a singularity at that point, it, it works. And then the problem is, well, what, well, what do you do if you, when you have a singular point? And there things get a bit more tricky. So there you have to, to look exactly at what kind of function do you have, and, and uh, uh, you have to do some, do some tricks. Um, and uh, also, so for, for exp and log, there are some, some bigger procedures that I have to, have to uh, write uh, that handle this. And they can also add new basis elements. So obviously, like if, if your current basis is x, and you encounter something like log x, then you, you would probably have to add log x as a new basis element. And it's similarly for exponential. So you're, you're um, yeah, I, I'm going to do that later. Um, and then for more advanced stuff like the gamma function or the error function, uh, the trick is usually to, to like factor out the singularities in, in a way and express them in terms of exponentials or logarithms and then deal with them separately. Um, again, I'm not going to hear about that. Um, and so uh, for the, the question is, how do we connect these uh, abstract uh, series, these formal series, to actual real functions? Um, and I'm only going to show here for normal power series, uh, so in, in a single variable x, because it's a little bit easier to, to put in a slide. And it's, it's pretty much the same idea, just it, it's, it's easier this way and with fewer side conditions. So um, basically just um, you write an inference rule like this. So you say, okay, I have some function. And what does it mean for that function to have an asymptotic extension of this form? Where, uh, so this is the, the cons, so the list cons where you put this in the front. So this basically is like uh, you have here a coefficient c times x to the e, followed by some remainder power series. So what does it mean for this thing to have this expansion? Well, first of all, f has to be a big O of x to the e. And then when you put this, pull this term on the other side, uh, so you subtract it, um, then the, the, this is, again, uh, has this power series extension, this, this remaining thing has power series expansion. And so you can write down this as an inference rule. And then you can um, take this as the defining rule for a, uh, a co-inductive predicate. Or in another sense, is, uh, you basically take the greatest fixed point. And uh, then you have to find uh, this uh, predicate function. This function has this formal series as an extension. Uh, you have to find this uh, for all the cases. And uh, <coughs> then the operations, as I said before, are, can be defined co-recursively. And then uh, we can prove co-inductively that uh, the, uh, the operations are correct with respect to this predicate. So you can show, for instance, if you have, if f has this expansion and g has this expansion, then f plus g has the sum of the two expansions as an expansion. And you can prove this for all the operations that I showed you before. And it works pretty much always in the exact same way. So it's really just more of an engineering problem. All the proofs are completely straightforward and, and not challenging at all. Um, and for, so this is just for power series, but for multi series, it's pretty much the same thing, except that, of course, you have, you don't just have x, but you always have this longer basis, so it gets a bit more complicated, but uh, it, it's really just a, a blow up in text and not in complexity. Um, yeah, so uh, we can now construct expansions for functions bottom up just by applying the correctness theorems for, our, uh, for, for these operations. So as an example, Let's find an extension for, for this function for x going to infinity. So we start with 1 over x, and this obviously has the trivial extension x to the minus 1 with respect to the basis x. And then we substitute that thing into, our Taylor, into the Taylor series extension of the sine, and uh, that gives us an extension for sine of x to the minus 1. Then we have to worry about the e to the x, and there we have to add e to the x as a new basis element. So now we have a, uh, and this then has, of course, the trivial extension e to the x with respect to this new larger basis. So um, now we have to uh, lift the extension that we already found for the sine of 1 over x to this new larger basis. And, and lifting just means uh, that we uh, basically add, uh, uh, well, yeah, we just add like a new exponent, but that will always be 0. And then when we combine that, we have an extension for the, um, we, we add those two extensions together, and we have an extension for the entire function. So it's really just like a straightforward, syntax-directed, bottom-up procedure to compute and combine these uh, expansions. So you will have negative exponents? Yeah. 
What exponents do you allow? Um, pretty much any real number. Any real number. Yeah. Yeah. So the end result will be a theorem that tells you that this function of x has the following extension with respect to this basis e to the x and x. And this is what it looks like in Isabel, more or less. So uh, you have this blue thing here is the series for, uh, for one over x. And then you plug that into the sine uh, function that, that turns a multi series into a, a multi series for the sine function. And then you lift that to the larger basis. And then you add that to this other series for the, for the exponential function. And yeah, that's it. Uh, and you can, uh, yeah, you can evaluate this series, uh, and it will evaluate to something like this. Okay. So one technical problem, I think, not just a technical problem. One big problem uh, with this approach, uh, in, well, with any approach that, that that solves this kind of problem, is that you're going to need to compare real numbers. And in our case, real number just means any real number that you can write down in Isabel could probably uh, could possibly occur. Um, so, uh, including things like pi or sine of I don't know sine of two or whatever. Um, and even worse, uh, when you so uh, there's this thing called trim, trimming and expansion. So if you have an expansion, uh, you might have leading zeros and you want to throw those away to get the first like actual sum uh, summon that isn't zero. And for that, you know, to do that, you have to you have to look at a uh, real function expression, Isabel, and say is this zero or not. And obviously, this this is difficult, and it's actually undecidable. Like in general, you can't solve that problem. So what do you do? Well, this heuristic, which is just uh, whenever we have a problem like this, we want to find out is this constant zero, or is it positive, or is it negative, or is this function identically zero? We just for Isabel simplify that. It. And um, yeah, so um, uh, we use automation to, 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 to solve these problems. Um, and uh, it, uh, the simplifier might fail. So if the simplifier can't determine what the sign is, then it will, the entire procedure will just stop and say, I couldn't determine the sign of this thing. And then the user might have to just apply more information by hand uh, to, to help the automation along. Um, and for functions, it's uh, uh, basically when I, you, you yeah, um, okay, I should not go into detail, but so in function, in, 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 if you have uh, the, the same problem for functions, then there might be an issue that you get non-termination of this procedure in some rare cases where the automation doesn't recognize that something that is zero is actually zero. Um, and I, I also added another thing, uh, which is to use this approximation procedure that I, I mentioned earlier to, um, uh, to, to determine the sign by just approximating the, the thing by, by sufficient accuracy to determine the sign. And uh, yeah, and then if all else fails, then the user might just have to supply additional facts and prove that I don't know, like pi minus e is negative or whatever. Um, and this works surprisingly well. So uh, in in most, I would say that uh, well, most numbers aren't zero, um, and the ones that are usually obviously zero. So uh, this the simplifier can usually figure out these things reasonably well. And then occasionally you can't really have to help along, but that's that's okay. It's it's not too bad in most cases. Um, but yeah. So like the way that that mathematically, for instance, solves that problem is it it does the same thing basically. It, it has some sophisticated ways to try to figure out whether something is zero or not. And if it's not zero, then it, if it can't prove that it's uh, positive or negative, then it will just uh, no. It's like if it can't prove that it's zero, then it will just assume that it's non-zero or something. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, we, we now have a, we, we, we add some preprocessing and some some ML code, and, and in the end, what we get is a proof method that can automatically prove uh, statements of this form, where you have uh, yeah, you can prove limits, you can prove asymptotic equivalence, you can prove that something is eventually bigger than something else, but eventually means like for x large enough or for x close enough to one or whatever. Uh, you can prove things like big O. Um, yeah, and uh, lambda symbol. Big o, yeah, big O, small O, big theta. Nice. These are those are lambda symbols. Uh, and F and G uh, can be built here from like all these basic arithmetic things: log, uh, exponential, minimum, maximum, absolute value, powers, thirds, without any restrictions. Um, 
And uh, yeah, there is some support for the sine and cosine and tangent, but only when the argument doesn't go to infinity, because when it goes to infinity, you get this oscillation, and then there actually is no multi-series expansion, so obviously you can't compute one. So for that, you would have to uh, implement some even more sophisticated approach, uh, but these are, um, are very, very technical. Um, but yeah, so there is one thing that we can do about these oscillating things, like the sine function. Uh, and so one example is if you have something like the square root of flow of x. So flow of x is also an oscillating function in the sense that it oscillates between x minus 1 and 1. Um, and you can show that uh, this square root of flow of x is actually if, uh, square root of x plus something that grows, uh, that, that, that goes to 0, smaller of 1. Um, and so there is one obvious solution that I, uh, I implemented, which is uh, what I call asymptotic interval arithmetic. So the idea is that if you have a function where you can't really find a multi-series expansion because of oscillation, you just try to find a fairly good upper bound and lower bound for which you have an exact uh, multi-series expansion. So obviously for, for sine of x, uh, it would be minus 1 and 1, just constant functions. Or for flow of x, it would be x minus 1 and x. And so basically the, the, the procedure, procedure doesn't just compute a single multi-series expansion in that case, but it produces a pair of... Uh, um, of minus series expansion with a proof that these things are eventually bigger or smaller than the, the function that you're actually interested in. Um, and so this approach, it works in, in many cases, like the, the example above with the uh, flow, um, but uh, it, it's not complete, of course, because uh, you, you, can get all, you can get these uh, cancellation effects, that if you have sine of x minus sine of x, uh, you could in principle just get the bound minus 2 and 2, which is not what you want, of course. Sine of x plus cos of x. Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this, it's not complete, but it's, it's good enough for many cases. Um, so yeah, this is uh, just an illustration of, of how this works. So you have this weird function here, and you get um, this thing as an asymptotic upper bound, and this thing as an asymptotic <laughs> lower bound. This is what, what, uh, but an asymptotic just means that it's, it's uh, allowed to, to be above uh, the upper bound in, uh, initially, but it just has to work out for large enough value. Okay, and then so we can, for instance, prove that uh, this thing here converges to E automatically, and we can even have three variables in there, so we can prove that this thing goes to uh, E to the A um, automatically, and it, it just works. Okay, so uh, this procedure is now used about 180 times in the archive for formal proofs, and so most of these usages are actually by me. <laughs> Which is, uh, I mean, I guess the main reason for that is that I'm one of the people who formalizes most analysis, like this kind of analysis with lots of limits and, and, and integrals and Isabel at the moment. And the other reason is that I know about the procedure and a lot of other people don't know about it. And, and so they always have to, but so they're slowly starting to discover it as well. So I saw some uses by other people for, for home limit problems. Um, and so most users are actually for really trivial examples, like something like what I mentioned before with the x squared minus x. Um, but, but then there are also some like the Acrobatic example where uh, you would really have to, to do like hundreds of lines of proofs to, um, to do it without a procedure like this. And um, also, I think it's not really a problem that most users are for trivial examples because uh, if, if, you have, if you don't have to think about something like x squared minus x anymore, it's, it's a huge, uh, um, uh, hugely good thing. So uh, this should not be underestimated. And so my experience, uh, my personal experience is that when I, have, when I encounter some PDF on archive or something and it has like lots of integrals and then they change the order of integration or they pull a derivative into an integral and you have to prove uniform convergence, I used to react something like this. And now that I, I know that, oh, okay, if I have a complicated limit, I can just press a button and it does it for me. Um, I can, if I read a paper like this and I see like a triple integral and whatever, I basically can look at it like this. And uh, so that's why I could do the zeta of three just as a Christmas project. I looked at it once and said, ah, okay, like integral transformation, some limits, uh, should be doable. So yeah. Um, what could be improved? Lots of things always, of course. So the entire thing is still a bit, Shaky, it's a big implementation, a lot of an error code, uh, sometimes things go wrong. But the entire thing is, so it, uh, I should mention this, so uh, they, they, it's, proof it's, it's a proof-producing procedure. 
So it, uh, when it fails, the worst thing that can happen is that it, it fails to prove something that it should have failed to prove, but you can never get a proof uh, of something that's actually wrong, even if I have a bug in my code, unless there's also a bug somewhere in the usable kernel. So, um, yeah, it's really just a question of sometimes it's a bit fragile and it, it fails to prove something that it should have been able to prove. So but one big problem is that the support for the gamma function and some things like the error function and even the arc tangent is still a little bit incomplete. So there were some cases where um, not because of the bug or anything, but just like a fundamental problem that I, I, I won't go into now. It, it just doesn't work. Um, and basically, like what mathematical or something do there, I basically didn't understand why it holds. And I asked some computer algebra people, and they weren't really able to tell me why it holds. Um, and it doesn't hold. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it probably holds, but it's just that like, I, could not, I could never find anyone who would actually sit down and do the proof for me, and I, I couldn't find it myself. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's not something terribly important to me at the moment. Um, then the zero-mess testing thing could be improved uh, as well, because sometimes it does fail and it's annoying. Um, and also, I'm, I'm very certain that you could do the exact same thing. Well, not for complex functions. I think for complex functions it doesn't work because of uh, like in complex, the complex limits are a bit more tricky because you can approach them not just from two sides but from many different sides. Um, but if you have uh, a meromorphic function, so functions with Laurent series extensions, then you can do the exact same thing and it's actually much easier because you don't have to worry with, about basis functions, you just have one basis uh, function that's x. So you can just do power series extensions and do the exact same thing otherwise. So uh, I'm, I'm planning to implement this at some point. And uh, the advantage of this is that it would also uh, give you a way to automatically say uh, this this function <coughs> has a pole of order. This is uh, this there. Uh, um, you can automatically compute residues, which is very important in complex analysis. So it would, would be very uh, helpful. Um, so yeah, uh, now I guess we have how much more time do I have? Uh, none. None. Okay. In that case, there won't be a demo. <coughs> Well, uh, no. thank you very much for the talk. <laughs> we have questions. I think we should question the demo. Uh, okay. Uh, so on the floor. Yes. Do you have any sense of uh, how much we're using our specific Isabel? I'm pretty sure that nothing is specific to Isabel. Co-inductive time. I don't, I don't know what code does it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just use it. I had never understood it. <laughs> uh, but I think that's something to take offline. <laughs> and maybe to ask to someone who isn't me. True? In principle, I don't see why not. <laughs> how, how long is the um, I can try to find out. Uh, so, uh, this is an example. So, about uh, maybe 6,000 lines ish. And let's see how it's. And about 6,000 lines of ML code. So, yeah, about 6,000 lines of Isabel, 6,000 lines of ML code. So, as, but as I said, like, these, the, it's not like improving like big theorems there. It's really just very simple, obvious uh, theorems. Uh, and you know, I have to prove theorems in many different shapes so that it makes it easier to plug them together in ML later on. So, it's really more of an engineering than it is a mathematical problem. Let's move to Mario. Uh, so, you can question about that. Moving, moving, moving on. How, how, how good would it be if the, the single file was replaced with a simple single file? <laughs> um, your examples, there was never an issue with somebody not being able to work out if something was zero. Um, That's an issue for you guys, though. Well, um, I should say that in. Um, but no, I, th I think in most cases it really doesn't matter because in most cases it's really something like one plus zero plus zero is greater than zero or something. So, um, um, so where is that Steelchus example? Well, actually, in the Steelchus example, I was uh, cheating a little bit because uh, so what I didn't mention here is that in this case uh, you actually have to prove that 
something is identically zero, which is obviously identically zero, but the thing is it's only identically zero in Isabel if X is sufficiently large, because otherwise it's sort of like undefined in some sense. Uh, so it's something like log of log of X, well, you have log of X once, and then you have something like, I don't know, like, what, no, so you have one and you have log of X divided by log of X, and log of X divided by log of X is one, but only if log of X is not zero. So um, yeah, this is just one issue. Um, so where this, this procedure is, uh, the can't figure out that it's actually zero. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know anything about the lean simplifier, but I, I think that as long as you can just apply simple rewrite rules, then it, it should probably be good enough for most cases. And of course, you need a good library of of of, 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 of uh, rewrite rules as well. Yeah, maybe conditional rewrite rules. That's true. Yeah. But as I said, I don't know anything about the lead simplifier, so I, I really can't can't say. <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I doubt it, but uh. um, maybe Sebastian, you can plug in your computer. Uh, if there is one more question. No. Okay. Um, in that case, let's thank Manuel again.